Okay, great. So welcome to the Community Preservation Committee meeting of August 26, 2024. I'm going to start with reading the preamble here. Certain meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with House Bill number 58 of the 193rd General Court, which extended the governor's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20 until March 31st, 2025. Meetings are typically broadcast on Frontier Community Access Television. So with that, we're gonna call the meeting to order at 621. And the guidelines for the business meeting, speak one at a time, follow the Deerfield Code of Conduct, be respectful, considerate, courteous, concise, and remember to raise your hand to be recognized by the chair. Members present, Lily Dwight. Present. Ben Benson. Present. Frank Leone. Present. Julie Caswell. Present. Peter James. Yes. Satu Zoller. Present. Gretchen Bicheski. Here. Kill your name there, Sean Libby. Present. And Kathy Sylvester, present. Guests present, I'll let Ben write them all down. <laughs> I hope I've got them. Yeah, okay. Any questions, Ben, before I move on? Do you need anybody else's last name? It looks like everybody has their last name in here, except Mary and Fran. So I don't know their last name. If you want to put it, Mary, if you want to tell us your last name. Yes, it's Bolso. B as in boy, U-L-S-O. Again? B as in boy, U-L-S-O. Correct. U-L-S-O. Okay. Got that, Ben? I hope so. B U L S O. Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you. And Pat? Pat. Pat Ryan? She's. And Fran. Fran. Do you know who that is? Yes, York. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I think that's everybody here. Um, so the minutes from August 14th, if I could get a motion to approve those minutes. I move that we approve the minutes um, from August 14th. And get a second. Second, Julie. And why don't we just raise our hands. I have to go through all members. Anyone that approves minutes, raise your hand. Anyone who does not approve or wants to abstain because they weren't at the meeting, that too. Okay, thank you. So before we um, go into the uh, 1888 building, I just wanted to bring up a procedural issue that came Peter brought to my attention, which in March, Mr. Hilchy, um withdrew the application for the 1888 building. But soon the select board sent a letter which I forwarded to the committee asking that instead of withdrawing the application, it be tabled to fall town meeting. And we agreed at our April 3rd meeting, but that was the details of that were left out of our April 3rd minutes. So I'd like to make a motion to amend those minutes so we can get that letter into the minutes. Um, and I also did put them in the drive, that the letter into the drive. I move that we amend the minutes from April. April I guess it would be the April, was it 13th? No, 3rd. Third. Third, April 3rd, CPC meeting to include the letter from the select board of um, March 26th, I believe it was. Yes, that's it. And can I get a second? A second, second Julie. I will second that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I think Frank can second it. Satu, I'm not sure you were at that meeting, were you? 
April. 3rd. I, I thought I was, but maybe not. No, Satu was. Oh, she was. Oh, sorry. So Satu did second it. And um, is there any discussion on that before anybody have any questions about that? So if not, all those in favor for those that were at the meeting, raise your hand. Ben? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Any opposed? No. Okay, perfect. So now I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Hilchey, so and his guests to discuss the application. Uh, thank you, and let me introduce uh, the notion that we're going to try to put together, uh, present a bunch of information in about 30 minutes. Um, Charles Roberts will be representing the architecture firm of Kuhn Riddle Architects, and Karen Michalowski is his uh, a, associate and Dan Pallotta is the town's owner project manager and he has with him um, historic preservation consultant Mary Bolso. Bolso. So um, I'm going to start out by turning it over to Charles Roberts and uh, let him share information you know the, the plans and so forth. He has a, a deck to present and Dan right. Be bounced in as as this Charles needs it. Great, thanks, Tim, and uh, thanks everybody for for inviting us here this evening. And uh, we have uh, a lot of material to go through in a fairly limited amount of time, so I'm going to try and be efficient here. And uh, I think we want to have questions maybe at the end. Was that right, Tim? If that's what uh, if the it works, it's, it's, the, it's the it's the it's the chairperson's discretion. Kathy, so, this, um, so the committee. We'll ask questions at the end. Yeah, we don't want to okay. interrupt the presentation. Okay, thank you. All right. So this is um, this is a, I have, I'm starting off with a few kind of historic images here. You're probably all fairly familiar with them, but it does it's it's kind of helpful to set the stage with some of these historic images to just kind of recall that you know this is a this building's been around for a long time. It's an important part of the streetscape, an important part of the history. You know, generations went to school here, um, and it's it's uh, you know it's exciting to think about being able to turn this over to municipal town uses to breathe another fifty two hundred years worth of life into the building. So uh, it's just kind of kind of nice to see these images. One one thing that's interesting in these is that we don't see any divided lights in the windows. Um, so it's just just sort of a, as a historical note, you'd lots of times you think about windows and buildings of this era having divided lights, but the fact that these aren't is is just sort of interesting and informed kind of our design uh, is moving forward into the addition and uh, and also sort of the approach we're going to take in terms of replacing these windows with um, historic replacement windows. This is a uh, Karen was great. She drove into into Boston and to the the archives there and was able to to dig up some old original drawings. These are this is actually an iteration. This is like the this is the elevation facing North Main Street. And you can see that it has a portico that came out at a half level, which isn't there now. It, it, it never was there. But it kind of it's interesting to sort of look at sort of a design iteration early on about something that happened on this building and a designer's idea that was that you know was uh was uh was was modified in the design as, as it went forward but again it's helpful to see the windows and the window patterns which which are which are very consistent with what was actually built and uh but it's a it's a good image um just want to run quickly through the overall scope of the project to give everyone a sense of what's involved we're focusing here on the costs for the rehabilitation of the uh of the ATD8 building um with you know considered separately from from the addition because the CPA funds obviously are going towards towards this building so uh just to give you a sense of the overall work it's a it's a complete demolition of the of the inside of the building um, on the first and second floors, we're demoing all the the floor partitions. All the, all the uh, first and second floor partitions. Um, we're removing the existing stairs. We're, we're 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 stripping finishes, plaster finishes down to the existing brook, brick. Um, removing all existing millwork to the extent you know to the extent that it's that it is or isn't historic. We will preserve millwork if it's possible to to reuse or repurpose or recreate as part of a display in the in the new building. 
but but all the millwork that's in there now will be pulled away, um, as well as all the floors and finishes. Unfortunately, the tin ceilings um, are not in great shape, and to uh, to um, you know update all the systems in the building and create the thermal envelope we need, we're going to have to remove those ceilings as well. Uh, we're we're going to pull off that little north non-historic north entry stoop. Um, uh, as well as obviously the uh, the existing kind of ramp roof structure that's there on the west side of the building. Um, we'll take out the uh, the existing southwest basement kind of stair bulkhead um, and then pulling out all mechanical electrical and plumbing equipment. So it'll be fully a fully clean slate once everything is is uh, is gone and out of that building. Um, Exterior windows and doors. So every window in the building will be replaced with a historically accurate um, aluminum clad window with a wood interior sash. Um, the, uh, the historically significant aspect of these windows really are the, are the wood trim molding around the window openings. We're gonna save and preserve the wood molding and then replacement windows will be will be installed into that molding. So the, the look and, and feel of the existing historic windows will remain very much intact. The window sashes and frames themselves are relatively simple and straightforward, and it won't and we'll will be uh, um, you know matching and working with Mary to make sure we get the right kind of historic profiles on these windows as we as we specify them when the project moves further on down. Um, we're going to replace the uh, the southwest door. That's the door at the uh, the stoop facing out on Conway Street. The North Main Street entrance is going to be decommissioned, so it will no longer be an, a functioning door, but we'll repair repair it, uh, the cosmetic sort of deficiencies and leave that door in place. Um, the interior fit out. Um, Karen, do you want to talk a little bit about the scope of the interior fit out? Sure. Um, so we're going to obviously, like Charles said, we're going to have to, I hate to use the word gut demo. It always sounds so harsh, but we are going to have to strip it down to its bones and kind of build it back up and put, you know, current um, systems in and, and, you know, LED lighting and electrical and all that. And we do need to, it's going to be quite a bit more um, partitioned off, um, compartmentalized than it is now. I think you're probably all pretty familiar with the building and it's basically got a center stair and the two big large rooms on either side, and which doesn't really work for what we need for the town offices. So all that comes out, we kind of reimagine the layout. Um, and a few more slides, we'll I'll kind of walk through the, the layout um, that we're proposing. And obviously all new plumbing for the bathrooms and the addition is going to provide, you know, accessibility to the entire building as a whole. So it will come in on ground level and it's got an elevator that will take you to the, um, the first floor in the second floor of the 1888 building. Thanks, Karen. Um, as Karen was alluding to, we'll have all new mechanical systems, electrical, water, sanitary. Um, we're going to use all electric air source heat pump, heating and cooling. We are providing some PV on the roof of the of the addition to help offset electrical costs for the for the heat pumps. Uh, fresh air will be brought in in a controlled fashion with heat recovery ventilation, which is a very energy efficient way of bringing fresh air um, into the building. Uh, we'll have a new commercial fire protection system throughout the building. It's not currently um, sprinkled, so this is a great upgrade. The basement, we'll, we're gonna bring in, uh, in addition to the the, um, the heating and cooling, we'll bring in dehumidification to help, to help keep that uh, basement dry, in addition to some other uh, things we'll be doing to the basement, which I'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Structural, the building's in good shape structurally. Um, the the gravity loads um, are all are all um, being satisfied by the current structure, except for perhaps some um, reinforcing that might have to happen underneath the vault in the clerk's office. The big the big structural um, uh, uh, work in this building is really going to be tying in the uh, floor diaphragms and roof with seismic anchors to bring it all together. Um, so. There will be um, seismic wall ties to the masonry, uh, existing masonry brick walls and uh, and the floor diaphragms and the roof structure. Um, the, uh, the building will be fully insulated. Um, the attic is going to remain in unconditioned space, so we'll be insulating the attic floor. Um, the exterior masonry walls will be insulated with two inches of closed cell foam. Um, they'll be stripped down to the brick and then we'll, we'll 
we'll do a, a, a full, uh, a continuous coat of the foam on the brick, um, on the interior face of the brick. The two inches is really the sweet spot for uh, for closed foam insulation on masonry walls where the, the wall stays warm enough through the through the cold season so that uh, so that moisture that's inside the brick doesn't doesn't freeze and and sort of uh, deteriorate the brick. So we're, we are getting air tightness and we're getting some some degree of, of insulation, maybe R10 or so, and we're protecting the brick at the same time. Um, the existing basement slab is going to be stripped down to um, its uh, its its uh, its top surface. Then we're going to put a vapor barrier and a, and a two inch topping slab down there just to clean it up and give good level surface. Um, we're going to look at different different um, ways of controlling the dampness in the basement walls. There's a couple ways to do it, and they're going to be um, cost determinant and uh, and cost ineffective determinant. So we'll be we'll be weighing those options as we move forward in design. Um, the slate roof is in pretty good condition. We had a, a roofer come out and and he was he was impressed by the condition of the roof. Um, there's a few miscellaneous shingles that have to be replaced, and we're going to have all new ridge caps and uh, hip caps and then and valet flashing. We're also going to have to install gutters. Uh, having gutters around this building is going to be really helpful in terms of keeping water that comes sheds off the roof from getting onto the ground and seeping into the basement. So it's part of stormwater management and also um, an effort to help keep water from getting into the basement. Um, uh, there is there is a uh, exterior masonry study that was done um, in 2022 by WSP, and we're going to be implementing those repairs, mostly having to do with removing a lot of the vegetation, um, some replacement of the of the of the uh, concrete sills under the windows, and some minor repointing. But in in general, you know, not not a lot of structural repairs having to be done to the masonry. There were um, Hazardous material reports done in 22, 2022. So we will be abating all lead and asbestos and mold um, that's that's currently in the building. Um, yeah, so that, that's the, the general work scope. Um, these are our drawings we're preparing. This is an excerpt of, of the uh, schematic design drawings we're creating for pricing. This is a view from the west, looking at the new um, the, the new entrance into the building, the new addition. I'll sort of get more. I'll get more into the description of the addition um, when you know later on. But um, very you know, calling out the entrance, making it really clear and welcoming, and inviting with some hardscape and benches and landscaping. And I think the addition does a nice job of of framing and honoring uh, uh, the brick of the uh, the 1888 building just behind. This is a conceptual site plan um, put together by the Berkshire Design Group. Um, it's it's in process, but um, this is this is our addition right here, tucked behind the 1888 building. So it it defers to the it, it, it defers to the 1888 building from Conway Street, from North Main Street. It's virtually not visible. It's tucked behind the building completely. And um, uh, oops, sorry, skipping around here. Um, and so here's the 1880, 1888 building, our addition. This is a, a possible proposed um, drive-through uh, bay, three-car bay for the police station. So we're just thinking conceptually about, about creating, part, you know, re revamping this parking here that currently exists between the 1888 building and the church, creating improved parking here, double-loaded parking here that could serve the greater sort of uh, campus of buildings and then the drive through here for the police station. Um, again, this is conceptual and it's gonna be part of a, it's gonna be developed as part of an overall parking and circulation plan that's gonna incorporate, you know, the uh, the senior center and the library. It's it's adaptable and flexible. Um, it's not, as I said, it's not set in stone, but it's sort of the beginning of, of the beginning of the conversation. It's a, and it and becomes a placeholder for, you know, the, the, first, the first iteration of the site. And this is our first floor plan, and I'm going to let Karen take over. I'll, I'll use my mouse to point. <laughs> sure. Um, all right, so you can see where the 1888 building is and where the new addition is to the left. We've kind of illustrated that at the top of the sheet. Um, and it's connected by, we're calling it like a bridge. So it's kind of a suspended um, connection between the two, and it's kind of minimal. Um, and you can see that a little bit later in some of the um, 
renderings that we have. But you'll enter the building. The main entrance is going to be through the addition, um, like from the um, from the illustration that Charles just showed. Right. So you'll come into the building uh, through that vestibule, and you have a a lobby um, on that lower level that um, is right outside of the public meeting room. And this was kind of intentionally placed there. It seems like the perfect spot for it. It's kind of um, good for larger crowds, easy in, easy out. Um, and also from this lobby, you've got an elevator that gives you access to uh, the second, the first and the second floor of the 1888 building. So you can either take the elevator or go up that kind of half flight of stairs up that level and then across the connector um, into the 1888 building. So the connector's um, kind of a, a pretty um, experience. You know, it's got glass on both sides. So as you're walking towards the 1888 building, you're really experiencing it. You're seeing like the exterior of that building as you approach. Um, so as you go into the 1888 building, you're you're in the main like service corridor of the building. Um, we have some wall space on either side. So we're envisioning that as display space. It could be, you know, for public notices that, you know, we could, we, we kind of envision one of these spots to be sort of a, maybe a historical display kind of honoring this building, maybe some artifacts from the building. Uh, we're definitely going to try to salvage any, any pieces that we can from the building and, and use them in some kind of new creative way. Um, so straight ahead are really the service windows. We've got the um, town clerk and um, the town clerk suite, which also has the treasurer. Um, so when you're standing at those service windows, you're actually seeing right through the building to that front door, um, which is currently kind of hidden right now. So when you walk into that building, it's in a little vestibule behind that main, that center stairwell. And so you don't really experience that door very much, but it's very pretty. It's got um, a glass um, curved transom over it. And you also really don't see it from the exterior very well because it's got that portico that's kind of big and bulky and um, it's a different shape than the, than the transom. So you don't really see it unless you're actually standing at those steps. Um, so we've kind of opened that up. So it's really part of the experience when people come in and they go to these windows, they're going to see that front door and kind of, you know, get that historical, see some of those historical features. And we've left these suites as open as possible so that you're also seeing those windows, um, the exterior windows with the curved tops. Um, so um, the, yeah, the blue suite is, like we said, the town clerk. So we've got um, the treasurer, the um, accountant, we've got a vault for the town clerk. Um, the green suite to the north of that is the assessor's office. Uh, there's also a service window there and kind of a self-service um, alcove right off the hall. Uh, to the north in the yellow is a, a shared conference room. And then you've got your bathroom core in gray, bathroom and gender closet. So those bathrooms will serve that meeting room like at night if there's a meeting that's happening in that public uh, meeting room, the space will be open so people can go up through the connector and use those restrooms. And we talked about, you know, this second floor is kind of <clears throat> secured off, but the space will be open. Um, the stair to the southwest uh, will be rebuilt, um, be code compliant, and that will connect the basement through the second floor. Um, we don't have an image, we don't have a, a layout um, to show you of the basement, but that's really going to be just mechanical space, um, possibly some storage, but at the moment um, we're just thinking mechanical space. The elevator does not um, give access to the basement. It's really, so the access to the basement will be through this stairwell or through um, an exterior bulkhead that we is currently in place. Yeah, right where Charles is pointing. So if we stay in the 1888 building and go up to the second floor, um, we kind of come through that same stairwell um, into another service corridor in the 1888 building. And in purple is the um, inspection services. So we've got the town planner in there, the building commissioner, the inspectors, um, health inspection. Um, and right to the north of that is the conference room that they could use. Uh, it's kind of immediately adjacent to them. They could use it if they need to lay out plans or kind of, you know, meet with somebody in that room, but it's also available for anybody else to use. We tried to build as much flexibility into these rooms as we can. 
um, to the north and the in the north um, east corner, we have a flex room. We're calling it a flex or hoteling room, and this could be used in various different ways. We're kind of showing it as um, we call them hoteling stations. They're workstations that are shared. They've got um, a lot of town employees that are part time, and they may not need an office full time, but they need a place to kind of perch for the day. So they could be like scheduled and shared by different employees. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different ways you could use this room, and really, it, it's just going to be addressed with furniture down the line as we kind of get deeper into it, but it gives us a little relief valve for some of the needs. Uh, and then in the opposite corner, we have a break room and the other core bathrooms. So if we cross the connector back into the addition, we see the, um, the elevator straight ahead. And that whole suite is really the um, select board suite and admi town administrator suite. And that's it. Let me go back down to the first floor, either through the elevator or through that set of stairs. In the attic, I'll just point out we're going to um, have access to the attic through a pull down ladder, like it will be pull down stairs. And that will also just be mechanical space. Right. I think that's it. Unless you could think of something, Charles, that you left out. Uh, no, that's it. That's it, Karen. I mean, this, this, sort of organizing all of the circulation into this corner with the with the main new stair and the elevator is really nice because it ties all that together makes it really easy for people for for the public to come in come into that you know enter into the lower level down here and just you know bop up the stairs into the town administrative offices or be able to take the elevator and and circulate throughout the building so it's a, it seems like a nice clean efficient way to get people it throughout the building into the, some of the most uh, frequently used public areas. Um, these are the elevations. Let me just zoom in here and go through these. Um, so here, this is the uh, this is the south elevation. So we have the existing 1888 building here. Our addition on the left over here. This is that um, glass connector bridge, which is actually open underneath. So it becomes this kind of transparent balancing element between the, the two buildings. Um, uh, the 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 proposed addition uh, it doesn't mimic this building. It's based on the 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 idea it was based on was sort of the traditional New England meeting house. It's very simple shapes, ar architecturally very simple. Um, kind of it's white to sort of complement the the brick and, and not compete with it. And then we we took the language and and sizes and scale of the window and opening the solid void of the existing building kind of brought that over into our building, but sort of instead of taking the modern approach of having windows with no divided lights, we're actually putting the divided lights in the new building and letting that sort of accent the fact that the existing building is 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 free of that. And then we have our, our corner entry in here, which is kind of working with this uh, corner of the existing building. So it's kind of a, it's an interesting sort of balanced, balanced composition. It's not really symmetrical. It's not, but it's it, it has it has a balanced feel to it. Um, this is this is the uh, the, the um, uh, North Main Street elevation, as you can see. Our 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 addition is nowhere to be found, which is great. <laughs> and then uh, we the we just calling out all the you know the the scope of work that that has to be done to this building, sort of reiterating some of the things I talked about earlier in the, in the masonry um, section and also with the windows. And we will be rebuilding as aspects of this porch. Um, the columns aren't in bad shape. The column bases kind of need to be rebuilt. The existing concrete steps, we're going to pull off that indoor outdoor carpeting that's there and, and see what we get, but it's going to have to be sandblasted and restored, um, hopefully not demoed and, and, and re-poured. Um, same with this porch here. This this porch is okay. The detailing's not bad. The concrete steps are, are out of code compliance. So we built, we'll be building new steps, and the the ceiling in this of this porch is in really bad shape. That's going to have to be completely removed, and we'll, we'll put a new beadboard wood ceiling in there. Um, this is this is an elevation section cut through the uh, cut through the bridge walkway at the the east elevation. So this is what's facing the. Uh, the, uh, the 1888 building. So it's, this is actually going to be a mechanical alley. It's going to be um, um, uh, air-to-air air, um, air -air heat pump compressors in the alley. So there's no, 
there's no real there's no windows here there's no kind of like interruption of sound coming directly into the building so we've left this intentionally kind of austere and blank there will be some ventilation up in here for mechanical equipment that's going to be up in the attic of that building um, this is the elevation north elevation that's facing the church um, we have a a, a a little back door in and out of the the uh, the um, meeting room, and again, it's just a it's just playing it really straight and 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 honoring the existing building without competing, trying to compete with it, not trying to exert any kind of architectural ego here. Just letting the building be very simple and kind of harken back to the idea I said before of those those New England kind of meeting house roots with very simple detailing, um, and and nice scale. This is the elevation to the, to the west entrance corner in here and windows into the meeting room windows into the uh the town administrative offices and these are some windows into the attic up here um, and then we just have some quick follow-up renderings so again this is what we saw on the cover page the inviting entry plaza um, this is the view from uh the corner of conway street and north main so really you know bringing home the fact that um, the the addition is really has no impact on on the, the main street in town, and uh, just have a couple images showing the uh, uh, the the addition and the and the uh, existing building kind of harmonizing with each other. You get a good sense of this glassy connector piece between the two buildings, so they stand apart, but they're connected. And again, as Karen said, this will be a fun place to walk through, and you'll get to see. You know the 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 1888 building kind of up close in a personal way that you don't really get to see any other in any other condition. Um, and I think that what we're going to what we're going to talk about next is is budget. And Dan, did you want to? I can if you'd like. Step up. Sure. Great. Thank you. So. <clears throat> uh, obviously, money is. Uh, the key to everything when you're doing a project. On this particular project, there are a couple of sources of funds, and one of the sources is why we're before you today, uh, which is the CPC side. Um, the 1888 building, uh, we are projecting that we're going to spend approximately $3.8 million on the 1888 side and $2.1 million on the new building side. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in the 1888 side. Um, and, uh, of course, we have contingencies and architectural fees and things of that nature in the total overall project. But from a pure uh, construction uh, budget, this is where we are. Uh, we will be doing uh, uh, two more estimates before we actually get the final estimate, which is a, a public bid, um, which, is the, which is the big kahuna. Uh, and we track the costs as we're going forward to make sure that we stay within the, the lanes to which we're, we have uh, been assigned. So if uh, if CPA allots us $3.8 million, uh, we will not exceed, uh, we will not spend uh, $2.8 million and, and take your $3.8 million. We'll actually spend the $3.8 million on the historic piece. So, Charles, do you have the next slide there? Too? Yeah, yeah. So this is like a pictorial, a simplified pictorial uh, overall uh, project budget of where we're going. Um, we've received uh, uh, federal funding, uh, earmark. Uh, we're looking for additional uh, funds anywhere we can find them and we're requesting three million eight hundred and six thousand from CPA. But you can you can basically see graphically the percentage wise is 55 to 45. Yet the construction budget is the opposite. So the federal funding will be actually subsidized in the 1888 building. And it won't be all CPA funds. That's 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 basically what we have for you tonight. 
Thank you. And it was just about a half an hour exact. Yeah, you did a really good job. I like <laughs> very much. I, we rehearsed it. <laughs> I really like how you can't see the new building from North Main Street and how you fit that in there. It's it's really nice. Yeah. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions from the committee. Then uh, Peter. Um, I'm Peter James. Uh, I'm actually quite new to this committee. I think I've been on the committee for 14 days, uh, but I've done quite a bit of reading uh, as background and uh, from a, a, a con my efforts are to understand the maximum exposure uh, that CPC in, in the town has with regard to this project. Uh, now the project comes in, uh, the construction project comes in at 6.5 with about $900,000 worth of contingencies, give or take. My primary concern is the stability of the structure to with the masonry wall uh, and the, the outside uh, wood studs as they interface with the wall. Um, and and I, I don't know whether you folks have actually been able to get in there and examine uh, the interface. Uh, I'm concerned that the brick the, the brickwork is stable enough. I'm concerned as to what the tie-ins are uh, to the interior structure uh, so that uh, uh, hopefully you've got a handle on this and, and we don't lose contingency monies uh, with regard to this problem. And I'm wondering if you can give me some uh, some additional information on how you've, how you've approached this issue. Uh, well, so yeah, sure thing. Um, we have been to the building several times and we've been there with our structural engineer and um, the, and the, uh, the roof is a, is clear spanning the entire width of the structure. There are these there are these uh, four sizable timber and and steel tension rod trusses that hold up the roof, which again clear spans the structure. Um, there are a series of, of of beams and columns running through the second and third floor down to the basement, which take all the gravity loads. Um, so there are no load bearing walls in the structure. Um, that which which was which leaves us free to pull all the partitions out of the building, and uh, and um, uh, because none none of, none of them are really carrying any load, and what what gets to your point, which is really key, is the is the uh, the seismic bracing we're going to do in this building, where we mechanically tie the floor diaphragm to the masonry structure with 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 uh, with steel angles and bolts and epoxy that bring that, that tie the whole structure together so it becomes a rigid box right now the masonry walls you know they're kind of theoretically flopping around like this if there's an earthquake but when you take when you take the floor and diaphragm and you mechanically tie it to those walls it becomes a rigid box and that's what really that's what really um, is going to you know, structurally pull this building all together. And it's, and it is a process of discovery where we are very early on here in, in conceptual schematic design. We have a design approach that we feel good about and there are, but there are errors we have to look at and, and, and that'll be a, a process of discovery, but, but we feel like we're, we're on, we're on solid ground with where we are right now at this beginning study stage. Well well, I, I, I'm very pleased to hear uh, your approach because this is exactly what I was concerned about. I saw a reference in one of the earliest uh, uh, investigations to some of those interior steel columns, and and and, and I didn't see any reference at all to the bracing uh, between the masonry and the floors. But it sounds like uh, there was stability. This, these particular brickworks have a terrible record out on the in the northwest part of the uh, country because of earthquakes, especially right. the old stuff. And and I because I have a familiar a long term familiarity with this building, um, uh, you know I, I would hold my breath. But it seems that you've incorporated uh, so cost issues with regards to the tie-ins and the obvious need to provide the additional security uh, as between the, the frame the internal framing and the brickwork, which is what I was looking to hear. So that makes okay. me feel a lot better in terms of cost control as well as the stability of the building for the future. The third floor uh, is an act of itself, and uh, and it you know I, I'm quite familiar with the vagaries of the third floor, uh, the piping to kind of keep it all together. But if part of your work is to stabilize that, 
to, so that we, we do not have sleepless nights, that's great. And this is the part that I was most concerned with. I have 15 years of experience uh, running activities in this building, and not the least of which was pulling my Boy Scouts out of the third floor who used to like to explore up there. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to go up there. And we did see that we we, uh, we were up there just this last week with our structural engineer looking precisely at those steel rods. Those look like they were a retrofit to the original structure. But what we, we have a plan where we're going to take those steel plates, angle plates, you probably saw in the middle of the trusses, replace those with the T, with the T brace, rethread the rods and tighten that whole thing back up. Their attachments to the to the masonry walls are, are, are sound. And so we'll be paying attention to those as we move forward through design. So oh, Lili, I'm going to call on Lili has her hand up. Thank you. Um, ADA compliance is an important part of the CPA's um, responsibility. And so I note that you have one handicapped accessible entryway. You have no access to the basement for um, handicapped compliance. And I'm wondering, um, is it ADA compliant not to have access to the basement since the basement would be a, an active part of the building? Um, so the basement right now is not going to be open to the public and uh, I don't think there are any plans to make it that way. And as long as if the elevator does, if there is no elevator to the basement, it could never be used for, for public use. And so, um, uh, so my, I'm sorry to interrupt, but really, um, ADA compliance isn't only about the public, but it's about, um, yeah. mechanics, right. Who might have a disability. Um, and also I, I'm just asking, I do not know. So this is a question. I'm not pretending I'm an expert. I, I just raise it as a concern and I would appreciate um, you can update me later and I'll be sure to share it with everybody. But I'm also wondering about, um, it, is there a possibility of a ramp instead of stairs? I think it would be really difficult to put a ramp in, unfortunately as nice as that would be. Um, mechanical spaces by ADA don't have to be um, accessible. Okay, thank so, you. Question and answer. Yes. All right. Okay, uh, thank just, you. I know it's it's part of our charge, so I want to make... I, I, I totally understand. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a question? You had your hand No, up. no, I'm not going to question my own architect. I was just going to say that when, when Charles and I and the engineer went up into the third floor to look at the truss rods, the engineer explained that there are federal and state regulations about how you have to tie the brick to the flooring. And uh, so I know that's part of the plan is to, can you, you know, to make sure that we meet those standards. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Mr. Uh, Peter? Yes, I have a, a secondary question. Uh, it, it's my understanding that you're essentially gonna gut the interior uh, of, of, of the uh, senior center. Uh, and and remove everything of a stud nature that you don't need, rework walls and things like that. I haven't had the opportunity to see the hazardous uh, waste study. Uh, and my concerns are that um, everything, if you're going to be gutting to the studs, essentially there's going to be a removal of the offending hazardous materials. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about the woodwork and the tin ceilings, which are essentially covered with lead paint. Um, and if, and if these are going to be removed from site and you feel that the, the numbers uh, that it's going to take to do this are, are within the realm, I'm very pleased. Uh, you know, I've known about this since I had, to, I had to run programs knowing full well of what was flaking off the walls. And uh, if it's going to be gone and it's within the framework of the numbers that you've come with, I'm a happy camper. So within within the, the within the estimates are actually a, a lead removal number, uh, an asbestos abatement number, and a mold removal number because there is mold in the building also. So all three of those have been identified by two previous studies. Um, the quantities haven't changed. Uh, unfortunately, the cost to remove them have, has changed. So uh, built within the budget are those being removed as part of the demolition. Well, that's great because it's a you know I've been around these things for a while and if you if you have that number and you know what you've got and it's going away 
uh, it's great. You know, you know, I do want to add one thing, though. You know, we, you talked earlier about the contingency. Uh, the contingency is there for a reason, and that is if we find something that uh, that Tim couldn't discover because it was, you know, buried between two bricks or something. Uh, that's why it's there, uh, and we will be using contingency, I'm sure, for something at some point during this project. Uh, and it would be for the betterment of the project. It won't be used for anything but the betterment of the project. But I don't want you to think that the contingency is not, uh, you know, not going to be used. It will be used. You know, we, yeah. There hasn't been a public project in Massachusetts that didn't use contingency at some point in time. Right. What so happens you, is... I'm sorry. I, I was I, just... No, go ahead. I was... I don't have to... Go um, ahead. Is the ten percent now? I thought it was fourteen percent contingency. Maybe. So I hope you can explain because we had this conversation, and so I'm confused between the fourteen and the ten percent. Before we do, can I ask everybody who isn't speaking to please mute themselves? Like Ben, Peter, um, I will mute myself um, because some people are getting feedback. Thank you. Well, I hope it's not for me. Um. With regard to contingencies, there are various different contingencies within the project. Uh, the 10% is the construction contingency. There are also design contingencies. There are also owner contingencies, and some of them multiply up. So, um, you know, previous numbers had higher higher contingencies. As we hone in on the exact uh, parts and pieces of every little nut and bolt in the building, uh, some of these numbers will shift around. Uh, at the at the level we're at right now, ten percent contingency is a, a more than adequate contingency for the project. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? There's not any. Oh, Lily, go ahead. I'm sorry, me again. Um, um, I really appreciate Mary being here, and I'm wondering. Is there um, uh, going to be a representative from the Historic Commission on the Building Oversight Committee, or does Mary, is Mary a part of the whole team going forward? How do we, um, how, how, how do you manage our assurance around the historic appropriateness? Because I know it's iffy. Thank you. Can I, can I answer it before she does? Uh, Mary works for us uh, on the OPM side. Uh, the original CPC appropriation for the study of the 1888 building required a review by a historic preservationist. Uh, Mary is that reviewer. Um, so before the project goes to bid, uh, Mary will be reviewing uh, the documents, making sure that you know the details are appropriate and that we're we're dotting all our I's and crossing our T's with regard to historic. Beyond that, Mary, you can fire away. <laughs> <laughs> now, so um, the uh, Karen and Charles from Clune Riddle and I have been in contact. We have already reviewed some of the details. Um, so I will be reviewing them. I've been doing this for about 30 years. Um, I do have my master's in historic preservation from the U.S. Amherst Graduate School of Architecture. So I do meet the Secretary of the Interior Standards. So I'll do everything I can to bring you home. That's excellent. Any further questions from the committee? Uh, Mr. Hilty. Jimmy, you're muted. You're muted. You, sorry, I neglected to in, introduce Joseph Matty, who is the, so, the architect independent architect that's been helping um, the building advisory committee to work with the OPM and, uh, and the architects on this. And, um, you know, he's got 45 or 50 years of experience doing this work. And he and Vern Harrington were uh, critical to having professionals who are both building construction people and architects who worked on thousands of, uh, probably a couple thousand projects between them. Um, and they were very helpful in, in, you know, helping us to make decisions as we moved forward. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. 
So I, I think that, you know, we've got the information we need. I am pretty excited that we have the money in, in our undesignated funds to do such a large project. This is exactly what the money is there for. Um, we haven't had such a meaningful, I think, project for the community in a while since senior housing. Yes, I wouldn't forget senior housing. But and there's you know few of those that we've done right that are really that major, and this um, is really exciting. So, in my opinion, I think we should vote on this tonight. If people have no further questions or concerns, everybody in agreement with that. Um, Mr. Peter, you want to unmute yourself? that you know I have, I have no problem with with, with uh, voting tonight I, I think that it, it, there will be conditions that we will put in place as part of any approval process uh, and I don't know if you want to do a two-step uh, where you approve the project subject conditions and then have discussion periods as as, as the conditions uh, arise I, I'm not sure how you would like to proceed but the is clear that there will be limiting conditions, which people have already discussed. Uh, and I reference back to the prior town meeting uh, article that authorized phase one, and, and I'm looking at conditions very similar to what were contained in that particular article. Uh, so when you do the voting, uh, I don't know whether you want to bifurcate it or, or how you want to handle that. So I saw, we did talk about conditions and I thank you for reminding me about that. So one is that I was hoping that once, if we got a detailed financial breakdown, once you have it, um, that the committee would like to see it. We also wanted a six month um, review, not review, but just report on where things are at as things get underway. Um, Mr. Hilch, you had a, your hand yeah, up. Yeah. So, um... One of the things that I wanted to mention is that we have a plan to expand the building advisory committee. Um, if the CPC votes to recommend the project and the voters approve it, we would ask that the chair and the vice chair of the CPC join that committee to be part of the process of re reviewing uh, the project as it develops and as we get closer to construction drawings, um, because CPC is providing almost half the money for the project. So we think it's important for you people to be involved. Um, and we certainly uh, wanna have the conditions of uh, that were in the last, the, the first phase of this project uh, be reflected. And I think that uh, when I was doing, I, I think I was the chair at that point of the CPC and um, we worked with town council and uh, the the administrator to make sure that the the um, town meeting warrant reflected all of the language uh, and also the uh, authorizing warrant item that spells out the restrictions. So, thank you for thinking of that. I I, I hope you can make it similar to the last one because uh, if it gets too complicated. It, it it gets hard for the voter to understand. Well, my concern my concern is that, and and I appreciate it. If you're going to go out to bid, you don't want a a, a ton of extra conditions. Uh, and from a legal perspective, uh, uh, I, I certainly think that I was very pleased when I read the article um, that that I think was the twenty uh, the twenty three uh, ATM, uh, and it the conditions seem to be pretty comprehensive. Uh, the uh, the CPC will have a continuing role. They will want to have uh, some financial assurances as to how things are going. Uh, and they will also want some money back if, in fact, you come in at budget. Uh, so in it, but I think that you'll see that the, and I don't think any of that uh, would affect going out to bid with a project because right? I don't think CPC wants to get into that mess. Uh, so it, it's just a question of, of, of whether you give CPC time to figure out those conditions uh, uh, in the near future, uh, and I and I am not, you know, my sense, my personal sense is 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 you vote on the project tonight uh, with the idea that you know, we're going to refine the conditions over the next three or four weeks. 
uh, and have the opportunity to, to check that out. Because definitely you don't want any loose ends when you go out to bid. That's just my thought. Any other comments? Oh, Julie. There we go. Uh, I just want to speak in, in favor of uh, that approach that um, Peter was just talking about and Kathy was talking about. Um, I think what we uh, should vote on now is um, approval of the of the project uh, with a stipulation that in the next, I'd say two weeks, um, we work on the list of conditions and uh, work with town council, uh, town administrator on the wording of the warrant. Um, we're certainly not, I don't think we're ready uh, to vote just, okay, dead out approval, um, but I think uh, we would need to come back to make a check on the conditions and the wording of the warrant. Unless there's issue, problems with doing it that way. And, you know, I, I just want to make sure the warrant has what everyone's happy with so that everybody can stand up and, and be proud of that vote. Um, if, if something was, was errant in the warrant, language, I don't think you're going to find the, the committee as constituted or the designer or the OPM, you know, trying to not do something. We, we've been we've been trying to do something. Uh, we've been trying to adhere to everything that we can as we we're moving forward. And I think that the design reflects that. Uh, I think it reflects the willing, uh, the, the thought process of the residents of Deerfield so far. So I, all I want to make sure is that you get the language right. You know, so um, I, I do think you should vote to, you know, approve the project and the amount and, you know, subject to uh, the final language from town council. Any other thoughts? Uh, Mr. Hilchey? Yeah, so I just wanted to second what um, Dan Pilata was saying that um, I think it would be worthwhile approving the project to recommending the project to voters, because of course your approval is not the one that counts. It's what the voters say. And obviously work closely with town council to develop the language and to include all the, all the caveats and requirements that CPC needs to make sure that the money spent properly. The voters count, but without your vote, we can't get to the voters. Well, true. I mean, <laughs> I don't want Nine to people text. or seven people get to say, this is worthwhile, send it forward. Um, but obviously what I mean is that we are a town meeting government and voters decide what money gets spent. Right. Lily? Um, if I'm understanding, oh. then the idea is that we vote to approve or not approve tonight. And assuming we vote to approve, we do it in such a manner to say that um, to be recommended with contingencies, that means we should have another meeting as soon as possible to enumerate those contingencies to give the town attorney the time to get the language right, right? It would seem so. Because that's not something that can be done via email, I don't think. You would... cannot deliberate via email. Yeah, that's what I, I don't think that's right. legal. Right. I, obviously, we're trying to, we're, we're tr we want to educate the, the, the town meeting members. And, you know, we want to make sure that they get all the pertinent information. And the more time we have, uh, the better chances of success all of us are going to have. Um, which is why, uh, you know, the, the support of the uh, CPC uh, is is crucial. I think that the I think that the sausage making on the details of uh, the the release of funds or, or, or oversight, I think, can 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 happen. Really, what is the? And I guess this is directed at uh, Mr. Hilchey. What is the deadline for? warrant article language. I know we have a placeholder, but 
He knows a deadline. September 20th, I believe. Okay. Well, the warrant is going to, the warrant is slated to close sooner than that. So the actual language of the warrant can be adjusted. So um, by, by recommending this tonight and giving, giving us the vote that the application meets the guidelines, that's the first step. The second step is working with town council to write the warrant articles to reflect what the CPC needs in order to ensure the money is spent properly. And, you know, that's, that's the pattern that we've always used in these projects is that uh, the town council knows how to phrase these things so that if there's any leftover money, it comes back to the CPC. And um, so I, I don't see any reason why, and, and well, the CPC must decide this, but it seems like we presented enough information to get the first approval and then to work to make sure that the warrant articles, which you would then work on with the town council and town administrator meet the second part of your concern. But it would, if we get approval tonight, it helps us as set up town meetings to educate the public. We're looking at two or three and um, until we get a, an actual vote, it's difficult to go out and talk to people about a project that may or may not happen. So it sounds like we need a motion to approve the application to move forward to town meeting um, with the understanding that there will be some contingencies forthcoming. Does that sound right? So I will entertain a motion. I propose a motion uh, that we approve the project subject to uh, the completion of uh, contingents, uh, contingencies as, as, as reflected in the um, April 25th, 2022 um, warrant article uh, and, and, and to be reviewed by town council all within a period of 30 to 45 days. I have a concern that um, those, I don't know what those um, contingencies were. So I'm personally not comfortable saying that I want to make it contingent on those contingencies. Yeah, I would agree. I, I don't know what they are either. I think we have to be a little looser on the language that we will determine as a committee what those contingencies are um, at our next meeting. And when everybody has a chance to review those contingencies, maybe add and subtract. From oh, I don't, have any, I don't have any problem with that approach. I, I, I was trying to give the benefit to the applicant with giving some language now, but I would prefer to, I, I would prefer to have a, another meeting to discuss the various conditions. Um, uh, and I think we've made substantial progress tonight, but we still need to get through uh, the extras uh, that, CPC needs to see as it is presented to the town because the town's asking for our opinion, not just a rubber stamp. And, and, and I think that we have an independent series of rules that we have to comply with. Um, but I'm also, I've, I've done this enough to know that we don't want to screw it up with unrealistic conditions. And Julie, did you have your hand up? Maybe not. Uh, like yes, I, yes, I, I did. Um, I just want to, um, uh, I guess, friendly amendment type of thing. Um, 30 to 45 days is um, puts us a uh, past um, right up, you know, wait uh, too close to the town meeting. So I would say we need to uh, come back through this second level of, uh, well, certainly by September 20th when the final language needs to be done by the warrant, but um, maybe a week before that would be a better goal for um, the timing. And I guess I wouldn't call them contingencies so much because they're not like, I don't know, are they if thens or are they just um, the special conditions? Conditions, I think, is a, a better word. So, um... I guess what we need is a motion to 
to approve the, am I, am I hearing you right, Peter? They approve the project uh, with the understanding there will be some conditions forthcoming in the next 14 days. Mr. Dunn, do you have a question? Yeah, Christopher Dunn, uh, town planner. If you'd like, I can pull up the warrant article from April 2022, and that'll show you what conditions were attached to that approval. Yeah, yeah. and there's a couple that are intertwined. I think they need that. I've got the warrant in front of me. Mm -hmm. and, and they, I think that there were a couple that were coming from a, a, a few different areas. So I, I, I frankly think that the committee needs to chat about it. Um, and, and having a copy of that warrant uh, that article is passed would certainly be helpful, but I, I, I got, the, I have the feeling that the committee is is comfortable uh, with the approval this evening, but will need a couple of weeks to refine what they want for conditions. That's just the way I sense it. It's not unreasonable. So, what? How about this? I, I move that we approve the application for the 1888 building project funds with the understanding that we will be putting conditions on the warrant article to ensure compliance with CPA guidelines. I'll second that. Any discussion? There's no discussion. I'm going to take a vote and I'm going to call on each one of you. So there's no, we have no question whether people are voting or not. So I'll start with Ben. Is he available? Ben? His hand, his hand went up. You need oh. to unmute though, because it will be recorded. You have, to, you have to audio. Yeah, we need your audio. You're muted, Ben. Well, while Ben's doing that, I'm going to move on. Peter? Uh, I okay, Gretchen. I approve. Ben? I approve. Said to. I approve. Julie? I approve. John? I approve. Frank? I approve. Neely? I approve. And Kathy, I approve. So we approved the application unanimous, unanimously. I think we would be wise to set up a date for our next meeting before we leave this discussion because <laughs> I know we're going into a holiday weekend. People's schedules are tight. So um, let me see. Um, as is the third a possibility. It's a Tuesday. It's next week on Tuesday. I can I do it. You have family that week, I think, right? Ben can do it. Okay. I may have a hard time on the third. Okay. And I know Lily's going to have trouble on that day. So I can tell by the look on your face. Um, <laughs> are there any, do we need to go out the following week? Uh, Lily, what were you saying? What about the fourth? Let me take a look at the fourth. Um, I can do the fourth. How about others? I I'm can't do this. Sad too can't. I have another meeting. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So let's see if we can get a quorum for the fourth because I know we're not going to probably get everybody. Gretchen, can you do the fourth? I don't have my calendar in front of me. I hid in a dark corner of the house for the meeting, <laughs> and uh, it's not accessible at the moment. Peter, can you do the fourth? I can. And Lily can, and I can. Ben, Julie. I can. I can do it. Frank, Sean. Okay, so we have a quorum. So why don't we get together on the fourth? Meanwhile, um, 6.15? Yeah usual weird time okay <laughs> yeah i don't know how you ever picked that time i had yeah, who set that up i know um meanwhile christopher could you shoot the committee the those um, conditions from 2022 yep happy to that'd be um, great great 
and then meantime, just be thinking what else you might want to add to it or subtract from it. So, Kathy, is there somebody from uh, the, the applicants team that would like to informally uh, receive our, our thoughts on it? Um, or are they going to uh, are they going to come to the meeting on the fourth? Because I know it's. A... I'll let Mr. Hill. So the the fourth there is a select board meeting at six o'clock, mm -hmm. but um, I'm going to because of the shortness of the time, um, I'm certainly going to encourage um, Casey Warren and Christopher Dunn to alert the uh, the town council that. The CPC is going to need their attention and time, and uh, you know to help move the process along. So um, they may also have a, a method for having each each person suggest conditions if they aren't reflected in the 2022 language that Peter referenced. Um, but uh, we will give you every support we can. Another thought is, I mean, can we meet at five? So that you could be there, you know, because your meeting's at six, Jim. Is that right? And I could do five as well. And Satu can do five. So, is there anyone that cannot do five o'clock that day? John can't. Ben can. Yes. Julie, you have your hand. Gretchen. Gretchen. Yes, not sure, not sure. Okay, Peter, you can. I can. Frank can. And then if we did it at five, would you be there? So I think it's important to have you there. Sure, and, and if it would be helpful, I can see, well, Christopher, I don't know, will you be driving home at that time? You, you'd be able to dial in? Yeah, at five o'clock, that should be fine. And. Perhaps we can get, you know, some input from the council. I'll, I'll I'll check on that end if you think that's an important component, or we can bring them in after you guys make your determinations about what you want to focus on. So you're saying when I I'm not sure what you're saying. So in other words, I'll if you want to if we want I can try to get the lawyer to sit in. If you don't, we can bring bring the lawyer in later. Do you know who's going to be representing uh, the law firm? I'm not sure if Lisa will do it, Lisa Mead will do it herself, or if it will be, um, usually she helps write the warrant articles. Well, uh, tell, tell Lisa that I'd love to see her again. I shall do that. <laughs> I mean, um, she said it makes sense to have her there because I want to know what issues, you know, before it's too late. I don't want to do all this work and then have her say, you know, this isn't right or. Right. And I can ask. Uh, Christopher and I can ask her to weigh in on the language that this was in the 2022. Okay. I know she helped write it um, and see if that's comprehen comprehensive enough for you or if you want additional uh, you know, con conditions. Um, so we can do that tomorrow. I can start the ball rolling about you know, you. making her aware that we're going to have this discussion and, and the CPC wants to be involved. Okay. And Julie, did you have a question? Because your hand's up. Um, I had a comment, and I didn't want to uh, get away from this part of the meeting without complimenting all of the people who worked on this project. Um, it's really an excellent project. And um, the response that you made to our comments in the spring <laughs> have brought it forward in a way that it's gained unanimous approval. And so compliments to all of you who worked on this project. Yes, you have worked hard, boy. Exactly. Well, well thank, thank you. Thank you. you. And it's a thank testament you. to Christopher Dunn's input. I mean, having a planner to help you anticipate and think about things that you wouldn't otherwise think about, create graphs and, and uh, visual aids that make it easier to understand the information. Uh, so we're very pleased that uh, he's joined the town. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I think we're going to move on to our the rest of our agenda. So with um, and uh, you have, unless you have something else. 
Okay, so the next thing on the agenda is the public hearing and reviewing the, uh, Lily, you had a question? Yeah, it is 7.35. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but my dinner is burning. <laughs> um, I just, can we, I think that the, I would expect that the conditions will actually be fairly quick because we have the, the model already. Mm -hmm. And um, for the presentation. We could um, take a look to that. Sure. Yeah, we can just move it to that unless people want to throw comments because um, we did share the the PDF unless anybody has comments, you can just email me and I'll try to incorporate them and um, stuff like that. To I can work on it ahead of that, but it is getting it's late. Getting, sure, I'm, I'm happy with that. Anybody have any concerns about that? So why don't we move on to public comment if there is any. So I don't see any hands up. New business unanticipated. I don't think we have any. So cool. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we are adjourn this meeting so Lily can eat dinner at 7 p.m. <laughs> I, I move that we adjourn. Thank you. I forgot I have to have moved to yeah. A second. Okay. All those in favor. Aye. 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 I sec I seconded Satu. Okay, thank you, Satu. Okay. Aye. Okay. Aye. Now I also have to eat dinner. So yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I ate before. I'm I, eating dinner. So, and with that we adjourn at seven thirty. All right. Thanks, Kathy.